uh, Scrabble, it's a mind-boggling game, isn't it? It is Scrabble just a random jumble of letters and words, or is there more to it than that? Is there beauty and rhythm within it? Uh, in the prophecy of Isaiah, there are some beautiful phrases and words. In chapter 9, verse 2, the prophet says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of a deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Where we're at, in the writing of this passage of scripture is that King Ahaz, who's the king of the Israelites, doesn't trust God and is distracted by the foreign power of Assyria that is breathing down his neck. This and King Ahaz dominate the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah. And yet the major theme from Isaiah of this book and this passage is that God is holy and compassionate and also drenched in saving mercy, that God won't leave them in the hands of foreign oppressors. Basically, Isaiah is saying, God hasn't left his people. And yet sometimes, if you're like me, it can feel like that, can't it? In that Simpsons clip that we showed at the beginning of the service, uh, their daughter, the very intelligent daughter, spoke about the id, In Freudian theory, the division of the psyche that is totally unconscious and serves as the source of instinctual impulses and demands for immediate satisfaction of primitive needs. Now, there's a lot of letters and there's a lot of words. Basically, it is all about feeding what I want, making sure it happens for me. It's all about me, centred on me, focused on me. This passage puts that me-ness, that centred on self-ness, into perspective and says actually in the midst of all the trials that you have in the life God is doing something there are so many words in this passage that can challenge me to look beyond myself the first one is darkness Um, the Hebrew word there for darkness can mean obscurity dusk night falsehood Ignorance. Let's just look at those words for a moment on the screen together. Does your life feel at all like that at the moment in the midst of this pandemic? And it's not just a darkness. The prophet Isaiah says it's a deep darkness. Does your life feel a bit obscure at this time? Do you feel like you're at the dusk of life? That maybe God's drawing the curtains on your life. Friends, we've lost a lot of loved ones in our church family over these eight months, haven't we? People we've not been able to say goodbye to in a way that we would love. Does it feel like night to you? I'm talking about inside your head, in your thoughts, your thinking patterns. Does it just feel dark? Falsehood. Have you started turning off the news because you're just bone tired of seeing one thing after another that is promised to be delivered and then isn't? Ignorance. Do you, like me, sometimes look at Facebook feeds and one person with great authority says this and then someone else with equal authority says that and they go to and fro and it's all just above my head and then you find out that it's not even true, some of it. Deep darkness. The prophet Isaiah says, this is what the people are walking in. 
Have you ever got up from bed at night and you walk round and you kick your toe on the bed because you can't see where you're going? Ouch, it hurts. You're frustrated. You feel all discombobulated. Darkness. I know that some of you feel like you're walking in a deep darkness at the moment because you've told me. And let's not put me above you. There have been times in this pandemic where I felt like I've been walking in darkness. Moments where you think, really? Have we got to keep going through this? Another word that jumps out for, for me from Isaiah's prophecy is light. And the prophet says this light is great. In the message version of this passage, it says a great light. It's sunbursts of light. You know that light when you look at the sun and it's just so overwhelming that you can't focus your eyes properly. It's almost blinding. And that Hebrew word can be interpreted as brightness, lightning. You know that lightning that flashes? Illumination, happiness, cheerfulness. Just look at those words for a moment. Brightness. Do you feel that there's a brightness on the horizon? Lightning. Are there flashes of hope in your life that keep you going? Illumination. Are there moments where you get a deeper understanding of God? Because for all of us who've struggled with our faith in this pandemic period, there are others whose faith has deepened because we've been challenged. We've rolled up our sleeves and we thought, I'm going to go again. And it's not that we're better than those who have struggled. It's just that we've been able to respond to our circumstances differently. And for some of us, there's happiness, isn't there? A happiness as life has slowed down in some situations. The taxi service has just stepped off the gas a little and we've had to spend more time with those we've loved and maybe even cheerfulness the prophet Isaiah says that although the people are walking in this deep darkness the people have seen this light they're not in that light yet but they've seen it they've seen that light in the midst of the darkness and you know that one candle that is lit takes away the power of the darkness. And so as they walk in this darkness, they have seen this great light. And this darkness and this light happen in the context of a battle. The message version says, the boots of all those invading troops, along with their shirts soaked in innocent blood. And there are so many words here about battles. Warriors, plunder, yoke, burden, bar, rod, oppressor, boot. There is great oppression. There was a police helicopter hovering over this part of Tunbridge yesterday for a few hours because there was um, something that went on. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it involved ambulances, police cars. They were all over this area. And I phoned my mum and said, Mum, um, make sure that you're in and the doors are locked. And then I went around our house and checked that all the doors and windows were locked because we didn't know what was going on. We knew the police were looking for three people. And in that moment, we thought we need to keep safe. Imagine that amplified, amplified to the point where you're in a battle. And so you have to lock down all the hatches. Maybe we're not in an actual, literal World War II battle. But some of us are in a battle in our own hearts and minds. And we've locked the doors, we've shut the windows, and we're keeping people out so that we can just keep alive because we are in deep darkness and the only way we can survive this battle we think is to lock the doors because there are warriors out there who want to plunder us, want to put a yoke on our shoulders, they are a burden to us, they put a bar on our back and a rod on our back, they oppress us, they put their boot on the neck of our spiritual and emotional well-being and so we shut the doors and we lock the windows the prophet says, when the light comes, there will be joy. This is increased festival joy. When he talks about joy here, he's taking the Israelite people back to their big festivals. They had three festivals each year that they all had to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. 
And he's taken them back to that place and said, do you remember when we drank wine and we ate rich food, when we sang the Psalms to God about how good he was, when we stood in the temple before it was rubble, when we did all these wonderful things together, when lambs were bleating and doves were flapping their wings, when children were running around and women were laughing and men were muttering. Do you remember those great days? Well, we've seen a light and that joy is going to come again. And I know that for most of us, the thing we're missing most as church is being together physically. Is singing, out of tune if you're like me, those songs and those hymns and those carols. Boy, do we miss them. But there is a light in the midst of the darkness. And in the midst of the battle in here, we will get to that place of joy once again. In the message version, it says it's sharing rich gifts and warm greetings with one another. And that word joy in the Hebrew can be translated as glee, exceeding gladness, mirth, pleasure, rejoicing. Glee, I've not seen the TV programme, but it's about people that sing and they've always got smiles on their faces. They get joy from what they're doing. It's exceeding gladness. It feels like a Christmassy kind of phrase, doesn't it? I wish you exceeding gladness at this time of the year. Mirth is humour, it's dry wit. You only use that when you're relaxed around people, don't you? And feeling comfortable in your surroundings. Pleasure. I um, bought some fish cakes for Joe and I to eat last night for dinner. I bought them on Friday and all through Saturday I was feeling slightly irritated because I thought, why did I choose fish cakes for our Saturday evening meal when we sit down and watch something on Netflix together, kind of an evening off celebration? And I kept saying to Joe through the day, oh, do you think we like the chilli sauce in these fish cakes? And why did I buy fish cakes at the co-op or if you're posh, the coop? yesterday I don't really understand it and in the end Joe looked at me and went do you want to get kebab instead I went that's a brilliant idea I thought I'd subtly laid the footwork and she said let's get a kebab and I just felt such pleasure as I was putting that kebab in my mouth whilst watching the television and rejoicing rejoicing with the Gonzalves is 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 over the birth of their new daughter when Catherine sent me through that picture this week, I was just so pleased for them as a family. And it's another just pinpoint of light because one day that little girl would begin to eat solid food and then she'd begin to stumble and fall on her fat-bottomed, nappied, cushioned backside and, and begin to mumble words and her sister will encourage her and she'll help her begin to walk and then she'll take those first steps on her own and her family will see it, even her grandmother in heaven and she rejoice up there as we rejoice down here and there will be rejoicing. And friends, we will be together again one day rejoicing physically in this place and rejoicing in the world around us in our everyday lives as we celebrate the presence of God. So who in this world of deep darkness and battle will bring great light and joy. It's a child. And we know that that child that Isaiah was talking about is Jesus. The baby born and laid in a manger who grows to become a man and a carpenter and about the age of 30 starts his ministry of preaching and acting out the kingdom of God. God is here with you now. And Jesus, in the midst of that deep darkness, brings joy. Which words does the prophet use to describe Jesus? He calls him a wonderful counsellor. Another way you can describe that is an amazing counsellor. Some of us have been to counsellors that haven't cut the mustard, haven't we? But when you sit with a counsellor who really gets you, and doesn't continually interrupt you, but helps you to become the best version of yourself you can be, helps you over that hurdle. Well, they are precious as silver. And Jesus is a mighty, a strong God. He's not a weak, wet drip. Jesus is mighty. Jesus is strong. He is the son of the living God, the exact representation of him. If you want to know what God the Father, God the Mother looks like, look at Jesus. 
and he's everlasting and he's eternal. Jesus was here before the creation of time. Jesus will be here at the end of time to wrap it all up and spend eternity with us. And for 33 brief years, Jesus lived on this earth with us. And for nine vulnerable months, he grew in the womb of a teenage girl called Mary. And he stepped out of that eternal everlastingness to be with us, to show us how much his heavenly father loves us. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Or as one version puts it, the Prince of Wholeness. Jesus wants to give us peace. Wants to give us wholeness in our lives. Sometimes I think we maybe think that wholeness means he takes all the bad bits out. Kind of like a a genie in a lamp that comes out and sorts it all for us when we pray the right formulaic prayer. I don't believe that at all. I think wholeness means that we're at peace with the challenges and the difficult things in our lives as well. Sure, ask God to take them away, but at our foundation, we are broken. And Jesus, through his life, death and resurrection, he's taken that which was broken and is making us into the best versions of ourselves that we can be through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. We're not going to be perfect this side of creation. But Jesus is always wanting to take us on and say, I am the Prince of Peace. And I want to give you peace in the midst of all of that mess that you live in, as well as the beauty that you experience. This is the Jesus that Isaiah speaks about to a people who are living in deep darkness, in the midst of an oppressive battle. And he says, hey, we've seen a great light, a light that is going to bring joy And he is a child. And we know him to be Jesus. How will he bring this light and joy? He'll bring it on his shoulders. The passage uses shoulders in two ways. It says that our shoulders are weighed down by our oppressors. And that Jesus, the child, will come and he will have the government of peace on his shoulders. For a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world, the message version says. Jesus is still in charge, folks, although we're in darkness. We need not ditch Jesus or our faith just because things aren't perfect. And I don't use those words tritely or lightly. But Jesus is the one who carries it on his shoulders. As I was preparing this talk, my mind went to Open House. Open House is a coffee group that meets here in TBC pre-lockdown and post-lockdown after the pandemic in Darren. So out there in the cheap seats on a Wednesday, in a Wednesday it would be packed. Any of you ever come to Open House? Yeah? Um, Do you ever play Scrabble? You don't do you, Bobby, because you're Italian and we haven't got an Italian version, so you can't do that. But I remember that they would be playing Scrabble and they would have a chocolate biscuit. Yes, Andy at the back. Folks, Andy always asks me for a chocolate biscuit with his coffee in the morning and I say, no, I'm watching your waistline so that it doesn't grow. But anyway, they would always be out there playing Scrabble and I'd go out and I'd just look at the four of them who were playing and I'd say, let me just check the words as the minister of this church that there are no rude ones. We don't use rude ones, they'd say, and they'd bicker at me and tell me off and all those kind of things. But they had such joy and fun as they played Scrabble together. And I bet that as I was going through those words earlier, um, darkness and light, battle and joy, that some of you weren't actually listening to what I was doing. You were adding up the letters on the screen, weren't you, to see what they were. Well, I can tell you that darkness would get you 13, um, light would get you 9, battle would get you 8, and joy would get you 13. And I find that, in a weird kind of way, interesting, that darkness dominates with 13 points, but joy at the other end dominates as well with an equal 13 points. And in the middle, we have light and battle. Will we look to the light in the midst of the battle so that we get joy? Or will we be overwhelmed by the battle and stay in darkness? We have a choice. And I say, let's look to the light rather than to the darkness. When we were going through the service this morning, it was quite ironic because I came to the service at 8.15 thinking, well, we've got no live band today. We've got no... um, 
you know, interview on Zoom. So this is going to be quite a chilled out uh, planning session. We'll probably have this wrapped up by 8.45. But pretty much everything that could go wrong went wrong. Um, and one of the guys at the back said something to me quite reasonable. And I just responded to him a bit sarcastically and sharply. And it wasn't a fair thing to do. I carried that round for about 20 minutes of just feeling a bit rubbish about how I'd responded to him. And it wasn't until I turned and said, look, call him Bert, or Bart from The Simpsons. He looks like Bart Simpson, actually. I said, look, Bart, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have spoken to you in that way. Because as I came to this passage, I thought, so often we use words to hurt one another. We use words as weapons, when actually we should allow words to shape who we are. Let's allow these words to shape who we are. In the midst of the darkness, let's look for light. In the midst of all that's going on that is bad, let's keep focused on Jesus, the one who died to save us. Friends, I'd love you to get a piece of paper now and a pen. And just to write on that piece of paper one word, just one word, that captures how you want to enter this Christmas week that will soon be upon us. I'm not going to say any words and plant those in your mind, but I encourage you to write down a word now, just as I am. I've actually misspelled mine. <laughs> And now take that corner of the paper and just tear it off and maybe put it in your pocket, which I'm going to do a bit later on. And every time you touch it, just be reminded, be reminded that you want to go into Easter week with that word as a focus and a centering for you. Let's pray together. In a moment of quiet, we just focus, God, on that word that we have written. And we choose from now, moving forward, to try and live out that word with your strength at the centre of us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.